Yeah. And you also talked about home ownership, which I loved because I'm still a believer, even with the, the kind of younger generation today, maybe not as much of a believer, but I do believe in home ownership and, and at least having, you know, a solid foundation start to your future too. So there's a thing now, and my I have an 18 year old son who is really, really interested in investing and kind of like stuff, financial planning and that kind of thing. And he's kind of falling into the mantra of. Hello, Empower Nation. Welcome to Empower Her Money Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Duncan. In today's episode, I get to interview Dr. Virgie Ellington. We're going to talk about medical debt. And for my business owners out there, we're going to talk about some really inexpensive options as you are launching your business to ensure that you have health insurance in place, the different type of insurance options that are available to you. We're going to talk about what happens when you do get into medical debt and how you can utilize a strategy called home equity sharing to help fund your business. Hi, Dr. Berge. Welcome to Empower Her Money Podcast. Good to see you, Angela. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes, I'm excited for today's topic. I know this is going to be extremely important. You know, I am the money girl and debt is a huge piece of that. But before we get started down that route, I would love for you to first start um, how you got started on this journey to what you're doing today. Yes, yeah, so Angela, I, I talk about this a lot. I've been, ooh, I don't like to admit how many years, but I've been a board certified internal medicine physician for more than probably 25 years at this point. And I've been a, a health insurance executive for like more than a decade, but it wasn't until I became a patient and met my hospital roommate and discovered that there's a real need for protecting folks from being taken advantage of by the American healthcare system from being victims of predatory medical billing. Mm, yes, I, I definitely understand that. As a self-employed person, I understand insurance can be kind of scary. So let's dive right in. So a lot of my audience are entrepreneurs. They're you know business owners, and we no longer rely on a corporate job to have health insurance. So why don't you um, give us some topics that we can talk about together and we'll go uh, a little bit deep dive into each of those. Sure. So one of the things I really like to emphasize for all of us, especially those that are realizing, you know what, I don't want golden handcuffs. I really want to, to launch, hang out my own shingle, I call it, or launch my own thing. And there are two ways that I really want folks to know that you really have to um, put in place to optimize for your financial future and your success. One is becoming your own bank. And we can talk about the details and what that means and, and what's involved with that. And the other is making sure that you're protected from catastrophic medical events so that you don't go into medical debt and have your financial future ruined. And so I talk about the important kinds of insurances that you can get if you can't you decide, you know what, I really cannot afford to leave my employer and do my own thing, hang out my own shingle because I can't afford traditional health insurance premiums. So I like talking about that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So let's dive into the first one about becoming your own bank. What does that mean exactly? What that means is borrowing from yourself and not going into debt. So people say, okay, you know, take out a, a buy first, buy your own home, condo, co-op. Co-ops is really difficult to get actually loans on. Try to stick with condos, ladies, if you can. And, or of course, a single residence. So single family residence, uh, uh, home building. So the traditional way folks think about that, buying your own home so that you can get a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. I don't recommend that because you're still having to make payments on it. And now you've got your home on the line. Don't do that. What I suggest is actually something that's relatively new. It's only been around for the past 10, no more than 15 years. And that's called home equity sharing. Home equity sharing is when a company says, okay, in exchange for future equity, we'll give you a, a fraction of your current equity in a payment and you repay that at the end of 10 years or 30 years with that amount that you borrowed, plus some kind of, um, I say, percentage of future equity. 
So it's some formula that they f figure out. Usually it's, I think up to, it can be pretty expensive, like 20 to 25% of future equity. What's nice about, and I feel is really important to think about using home equity sharing instead of the traditional taking out loans. I don't recommend debt really to go into launching your, your, your enterprise, your business is uh, because you don't have to make payments and it, people say it's expensive money because you're giving away future equity. But what's nice is if you have negative equity, if let's say something happens in your neighborhood and, and the, you know, the, the property value has gone down, you don't owe that future percentage of equity. They will take less equity. So it, the, the formulas are, I think, a little bit more fair for future equity as opposed to having to make loan payments month after month after month. And if you can't make it, your home is on the line. So that's the first thing I recommend. If in the meantime, we're, I always say, you know what, the folks that we work for, the companies or our first, our jobs that pay our bills, they're our first investor. They're the first investor in your business. So most importantly, 401ks or 403bs, basically your retirement plans. When you get started working, please, even if it's just 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, especially if they offer matching, you have to do it. That's just like free money, right? You cannot, you got to figure it out. <laughs> and all right. So the, the thing is, Angela, why participating in your company's retirement plan, 403b for non- profits or not or academic institutions that kind of thing or f classic 401ks is because when you leave you roll that over into an IRA and then when you're ready to start your business you do what's called a self-directed IRA self-directed IRA instead of you having your IRA invest in like Coca-Cola or I don't want to say Coca-Cola I'm a physician I don't like soda so what am I saying <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I think they owned a Johnny Water, right, right. But anyway, um, let's say Apple, right? So instead of investing in Apple, you're going to invest in ABC, you know, Angela Duncan's new company, right? And so there are companies that will help you set up your new company as a cor C corporation, the, just legal stuff, very, very simple things that they take care of from the uh, federal law and IRS end. You structure it as a C, they help you structure as a C corporation so that you can have your entire IRA self-directed or directed into Angela Duncan's new company. So that's what I mean by becoming your own bank. Yeah. So a couple of things you touched mm -hmm. on. Home equity sharing, definitely something that is not common knowledge. So if someone was thinking about going down that route, how do we even find someone that might, might want to participate in home equity sharing? Oh, that's an awesome question. Thank you for bringing that up, Angela. There's a couple, I would say there's about three companies that are well-known, well-established and have you know great ratings. I recommend HomeTap. There's another one that I'm, I'm blanking on, apologies. And oh, if I think yeah. of it, I will send it for show notes, but do research. There are top, look for reviews. That's yes. huge. And how long they've been in business. And frankly, customer service goes a long way. There is one company that was recommended over another when I was doing research for home equity sharing companies and looking into home equity sharing companies. And frankly, one of them, they're just like, hmm, if you're if you're treating me this way while we're dating, you know, what is it going to be like when we're married, when you have my money? you know, or I'm locked into a business arrangement with you, which is a marriage, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, nah, just, just my suggestion. Do I Do your research, make sure you hire a professional. Yeah, for exactly. sure. And, and I have a like history, a documented history, not just a, you know, recent fly by night. Oh, we just launched last year. No, let's stay with folks that have been around for at least 10 years. Yeah. And I like how you said the companies that you work for are the first investors in your business. So, and then I think that from a um, referral source too, you know, the people who you've worked with before, um, let them know that you've launched your own company and then they have the opportunity because they already know and like you to refer you business as well. So don't be afraid to like tell people that you're what you're doing so that they can help support you as well. Definitely. Exactly. 
Yeah. And you also talked about home ownership, which I loved because I still a believer, even with the the kind of younger generation today, maybe not as much of a believer, but I do believe in home ownership and and at least having, you know, a solid foundation start to your future too. So there's a thing now, and my, my I have an 18 year old son who is big, really really interested in investing and in kind of like stuff, financial planning and that kind of thing. And he's kind of falling into the mantra of, well, you know, you take the money that you would put for a down payment on a home and put that into your company and just rent. Well, let me tell you something. Nine times out of ten, your first company is not going to make it. You really don't want to. At the end of the day having your own home is forced savings. So the end of the day, let's say my first business didn't work. So I had, if I had taken the, my down payment for a home and put that into the business, then I would have nothing. I would have no equity and I couldn't be, I couldn't start again. So always, you know, live to fight another day, do forced savings. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. And you're protecting your future. Right. So one of the things that you're working on today, crush medical debt. Um, you know, talk about statistics with medical debt, especially for people who don't believe they can afford insurance and maybe what some alternatives are for people who are starting their own business and don't have that corporate structure insurance anymore, what options they might have as well. So many people believe that medical debt might use the term debt or the medical debt, or they hear crush medical debt, their eyes kind of glaze over and they're like, oh, that just happens to old people. Well, the problem is, is that life happens. You know, it would be, you know, people don't think of needing insurance. They think, okay, life insurance. No, I don't need that because, you know, I have dependents or somebody who really needs my income, but you know what? Death is what happens to other people. I'm going to die in my bed no injuries, no sickness, illness at the age of 104, life is awesome, right? It would be nice if things work that way and it doesn't. So insurance protects you from things that you can't afford to replace. Car insurance, homeowner's insurance, right? It's risk management. So what you're doing is when you're thinking about going without insurance for catastrophic issues, when we're young, you know, fabulous, awesome, healthy, bike riding, bike accidents happen. The most common um, statistics for women with breast cancer, most people with breast cancer who are diagnosed with breast cancer have zero family history. I can tell you that's my story. I had, I was um, a two-time breast cancer survivor, zero breast cancer in my history, my Mm -hmm. family history rather. So my point is life happens and protect your your financial future. So many people, especially young people think, okay, well, I'm going to go bareback. And I'm like, uh, no, it's not a good idea. If, and, and they'll say, because I'm going to go without insurance. I'm going to take my chances. I'm young and healthy and beautiful and awesome. I'm in shape. Well, that doesn't protect you from a, God forbid, a car accident, you know, or a, a bike accident, that kind of thing, or, you know, just, w- just rare catastrophic life events, life happens. So what you're going to do is say, okay, well, if you can't, if I can't afford, if you cannot afford the traditional health insurance premiums, monthly premiums, then at least protect yourself from catastrophe, the big cost things. So look into what traditionally has been called supplemental insurance, which is given through employers, things like accidental uh, accident insurance, critical illness insurance or hospitalization insurance. But I recommend, you know what, just get your own policy because the outside of your employer, obviously, because you're going to carry this with you. And the premiums are really, really, really affordable. And it's really just to protect you from, again, from things that will destroy your financial future, a major catastrophic event. So please do that. Now, I recommend you start with getting your primary care taken care of so little things don't become big things. So what I recommend is called direct primary care, DPC for short. And basically it's a monthly premium and all of your primary care visits are taken care of. In some cases, there's um, some like basic radiology services that are also included in that monthly premium, that monthly payment. It's like a subscription. It's like a Netflix for your primary care, but it's much more affordable. Things like 
I want to say like $75 or $125, something in that range a month per person. So I actually, I I'm not actually affiliated with them, but I was looking this up and I was like, okay, where's the most recent resource for where you can find a DPC, a direct primary care practice to join? And again, this can be virtual. Uh, it can be a hybrid, or sometimes it's just, you know, in your, if you're fortunate enough to have one in your area. And that's dpcnation.org. I just wanted to share that. Now, let's say, you know what? you're really on a shoestring budget launching your business and you really don't have any resources, even $100 a month is just too much of a stretch. So do what's join or look for what's called a federally qualified health center. And basically those are categorized basically roughly into what people think of as community centers or clinics and rural clinics. And basically what they do is no matter how destitute you are, how, um, lean your income is, minimal your in your income is, they charge you on a sliding scale, period. So it's really the way to go when things are really rough. Please just don't ignore your health. Take care of your primary care first. Have access to make sure like that cough that lingers too long that you go in and you can get it taken care of while it's still maybe a bronchitis before it becomes an pneumonia and takes you out and you can't work on your new business, right? And then, of course, the catastrophic stuff. Please back up your primary care with catastrophic medical insurance premiums. Great advice. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of younger people probably do think that way, that they're young and healthy. And, and we've seen the other, the other way happen as well. So what happens then if they have decided not to get insurance and now all of a sudden they find themselves in pretty deep medical debt? What are some options that they have? Thank you for asking that. And you asked this earlier about the statistics. The statistics are there's a reason why medical bills, the number one cause of debt and bankruptcy in the United States, and that'll just destroy your financial future if you don't know how to address it. If you get a big bill, usually big bills are from hospitalizations, a catastrophic event. And so I always say, no matter how high your income is, when you get a big bill that's a hospital bill, before you do what I call the three steps to make sure that you're not taken advantage of, you don't overpay and you get out of debt, that's getting a real bill with CPT codes, looking up, doing an AI search. I think it's faster now. AI searches, I used to say, do a Google search of those CPT codes. CPT codes are to medical services, what barcodes are to products in a store. And you're going to, in that second step, you're going to take those CPT codes and see what Medicare pays for that. And I get, I get the glazed look. I'm young, I'm beautiful and healthy. I'm not old. Medicare is for old people. You don't have to be old to make sure that you're not overcharged. Medicare is the lowest rates that retail rates for healthcare that, that health providers accept. And then three, you're going to total up that new number, the new CPT codes that you figured out, hey, Medicare pays this. You're not going to tell them that's your Medicare rate. That, that's the, the prices that you use, you're going to call back in step three and say, hey, yeah, you know that emergency hernia surgery I had to have or that that I got hit you know, by a, uh, by a car on my bike and I had to have hip surgery? You charged me $10,000, quote, in my case, I am willing and able to pay whatever that new total is you, you uh, were able to determine in steps one and two. So those are the three steps of making sure that this, what I call the only, only right way to pay a medical bill, right? Mm -hmm. So before you do that though, if your bill is from a hospital event, um, stay. So what you're gonna do is call the hospital billing department and say, hey, you know what? I, this is really a lot for me. Can you not, can you always say don't, it, it takes practice, but don't ask closed-ended questions where someone can say no, right? A closed-ended question, yes or no, no, you're not going to ask that because it's too easy for them to say, oh, no, you're going to ask, who can I speak with? Open-ended question, who, what, when, why? Who can I speak with so I can get a financial aid application or financial assistance application or charity care? Please always, always ask because nonprofit hospitals by federal law have to give folks living in their, uh, um, in the community in which they operate, living in the community in which they operate sliding scale income-based discounts, but non, I'm sorry, but for-profit hospitals actually have, for the same reasons for tax write-offs, they have just as generous, if not more generous formulas for calculating how much of a discount they'll give folks. So 
last thing, if you're, if you're still in a job and you feel like you have golden handcuffs and you're like, oh my gosh, my salary is $150,000, uh, my gross salary. And you know what, this hospital bill is $10,000. It's, I can't afford this, but $150,000, my salary, they're not going to give me a discount. I actually had a, um, a woman who uh, I worked with who had about a, I want to say almost $150,000 gross salary, a $10,000 bill that she was given by the facility. And she asked for a, a financial aid application and the entire, because their formula was pretty generous. It was an academic institution, by the way, folks, academic institutions, they tend to be uh, really generous, more generous compared to others, I, I find. But anyway, the their formula was so generous that because the bill is so large compared to their take-home income, in this case, her bill was totally eradicated. They said, okay, we're, we're discounting the bill to zero, your portion. This was after insurance. She had insurance. So her portion of the bill was $10,000. She submitted her data, her financial information, and they're like, okay, well, in our formula says that you owe zero. So always, always ask. Okay. So Dr. Virgie, you've given us a lot of great information and some options for both, you know, before we get into medical debt and then what to do after. So I really appreciate that. If our audience wants to get in touch with you, learn more about what you are doing, how do they reach you? You can always reach me at crushmedicaldebt.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you for having me, Angela. Much, much appreciated. Good talking with you. Thank you for listening to Empower Her Money podcast. I am grateful for you. Please make sure to leave us a five-star review, like this podcast, share it, subscribe, and let's keep teaching others how to take control and be empowered with their finances.